principle of my talk today is lessons learned in operationalizing insights. Uh, and again, my name is Nathan Bryans. I'm with ATB Financial. I'm a director in our Artificial Intelligence Guild. Uh, is that better? All right. <laughs> I will keep the mic close. Oh, so just to start with a little about myself. Uh, so I, I think like many people, I didn't really intend to get into data science or machine learning right when I you know, figured out what I wanted to do. Instead, uh, when I came out of high school, I really liked computer science and biology uh, to the point where I couldn't give up any of them. And when I was reading guidebooks, I, I saw this field called bioinformatics. And that looked perfect because it combined the two. I didn't really know what it was, but I enrolled. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it worked out. So I think like multidisciplinary fields at the undergraduate level five, ten years ago, uh, there weren't really any specialized courses. They just had you take courses from both departments. Uh, the majority of those ended up being computer science courses, which, which helped me out. It landed me a job uh, in Seattle working as a software development engineer in test uh, with, with a large operating system company down there. I was uh, working on the networking stack, so looking at a uh, well, application layer, HTTP, uh, well, applications and APIs, and pushing fixes out to millions of people every day there. Uh, so that, it was a really cool experience. And, and I think it taught me a lot about software and how it works and how we can, uh, well, how we can operationalize it. <coughs> uh, following those two years, I moved back to Canada. I, I came here to Calgary. I enrolled at the University of Calgary for a master's in bioinformatics, uh, that was really cool. This is when I actually started to learn about data science. Actually, back in undergrad, it was data mining. That was the thing. That was the hot topic. Uh, so now I started looking more at data science, machine learning, <coughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, some of this was formal. Some of this was just through our lab. We had study groups and things like that. Uh, but really, uh, the first two years here, the first two items, like gaining an appreciation for software, um, more in my master's, I started looking at well, this field that we're all here today for. Uh, now, just a little bit about my time at ATB. So I started in August uh, 2017 as a data science developer, which kind of, again, let me combine two of my passions at that time, so data science and software. Uh, now, we've had a few changes at ATB. We've kind of gone all in on artificial intelligence to the point where we have an, an AI guild. Uh, and now we lead, I lead a small team of developers there, which I'll talk more about tonight. All right, so if we uh, look at, oops, if we look at uh, what or how the AI Guild is structured at ATB, uh, we're a collection of squads around a few core capabilities. So the, the first here is business intelligence. I think it, it probably goes without saying why that's important to an organization like ATB. We need to understand our data. We need to make real-time insights on those, et cetera. Uh, now, the second and one of our large capabilities here is our automation work. Actually, for anyone who uh, attends this meetup regularly, our VP and head of AI, Dan Simmons, gave a talk, I think uh, February-ish, on, uh, on our RPA capabilities at ATV. So I encourage you to go find that. I think there's a recording online. But, but anyway, so automation here. We, we look for, uh, for processes that are inefficient or pain points for customers, and we look to streamline them using automation it, with possibly some machine learning or intelligence embedded in that. Now, the idea is we end up freeing team member time. They can focus more on problems that they're they're really good at solving as well as making customer connections. Uh, the final capability and what I'm here tonight for is our artificial intelligence capabilities or what we have in this core team. So this here is our, uh, well, the bulk of our data science work. We do have other pockets at ATB. So as Claire mentioned, there is uh, artificial intelligence work going on within our Leap Guild here and et cetera. Now drilling down into this, uh, we, we have a number of different well, project squads on the go within artificial intelligence. So we, of course, have on-demand insights similar to BI, maybe more ML, et cetera, involved in that. Uh, we have groups structured around structured data problems, so things like predictive analytics. Uh, we have other groups around unstructured data, so core, uh, like OCR, NLP, those style problems. Uh, we, we also do have a, a group looking at R&D. This is... Uh, well, somewhat distinguished, we're looking here, say, Horizon 2 style problems. Now, kind of supporting all this on the, on the right here, I highlighted our governance capabilities. So I'm not sure if we've given talks at, at this meetup about that, uh, but it is a core tenet within our artificial intelligence guild is this idea that we need to make sure we're doing things responsibly. Well, one, because 
you know, we're an institution that people trust, and two, we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And now here at the bottom, uh, acting as a horizontal and supporting these other, uh, well, what we call product squads, is uh, the team I lead called AI Stack. All right, so AI Stack here, if we just zoom out a little bit and how it fits in, it's a, it is a support squad. It is a, it's a bridge between our product and our data scientists and then what we're consuming or as a business. So we're uh, this link between well, what we're building insight wise and then how we're running that. And, and I'll get a lot more into that today. Uh, but just in general, our product squads are uh, comprised of say, data scientists, analysts, uh, you know, roles like that. Uh, this AI stack team is primarily what we, we, what we call AI developers. So software developers, who have experience with uh, machine learning, data science, AI, et cetera. All right, just a, a few things to set the stage on how we work. Uh, these aren't universal truths. There are groups at ATV using technologies other than this. Uh, but for the most part, uh, our data science work is done in Python. It is, uh, well, the models themselves and their exploration, experimentation, et cetera, is done using Jupyter Notebooks, which I'm, I'm sure many people are familiar with. And then, uh, well, these notebooks, uh, our production work, et cetera, lots of it's being done within Google Cloud. Uh, j just one other note. So I'm going to show a lot of things today. Uh, some of them are things we've tried and that we run. Some of them maybe we haven't got around to yet. Uh, maybe we, we've abandoned them for various reasons. But I do want to include here for the point of you know, sharing with all of you, just because something's not right for us as a solution doesn't mean it won't work for you. So it's worth mentioning. Okay, ju just another uh, plug before we get into things. Uh, as many of you might be interested, this, this talk, I won't say it's high level, but I'll say it's more focused on software, on, on releasing AI or machine learning models. If you are interested in what our actual product squad or data scientists are doing, uh, I encourage you to go to alphabeta.com slash articles. Uh, there's a number of uh, articles here, so you can read up on things like, uh, well, what do we have? On our optical character recognition capabilities and how we can use these. Uh, there's things like our, our real-time uh, yeah, real machine learning. And then uh, there, there's a bunch of just kind of <coughs> soft articles there on how we, how we work. Can I just speak louder, please? Yes, I can. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, just going back to this, this slide I showed earlier with how we work, but let's start looking at the pipeline on how things run. So what happens is we have, you know, we have some kind of data practice. This could be some kind of data lake, some data source, et cetera. It's consumed by our data scientists in one of these product squads. Uh, they, they iterate, they learn it, they make a model. Uh, it's then pushed into, well, uh, to the, the, fr the realm of our developers who kind of say, okay, they have a model, how can we, uh, how can we expose this to whoever needs it? And then finally, it goes to our consumers. So what this really is, is this, uh, this idea that, well, when you're looking at software, you're looking at some kind of development cycle. We, we work agile at ATV, uh, but you can imagine iterating on this, because it kind of looks like waterfall here. But we, we have this development. Now, it, it's a little confusing, because we have AI developers who are software developers. But our development within the AI Guild, if we look at what our uh, products actually are, to me, it's worth calling out our data scientists as our developers because they're building the content that is actually you know, going to make us money and going to improve people's lives. It's the content that's important for us as a guild. Uh, what our actual AI developers are doing here is looking at this idea of release and production. Just So how can we make these useful? Now, the content they build is, yes, it's important, like what we do is important, it, it's getting it out, but it's not our core business, right? So it, it's worth calling out that distinction. Uh, finally, we do have consumption layers. Uh, so this, I, I broadly call it the business. It's, it's various groups there. Uh, it's most likely some technical squad working on behalf of the business. All right, I was really hoping the pizza was here because this is a good time to break. But it is not, so we will continue. So today's talk, uh, what I wanted to, to really get into today is this idea between development and release. Uh, j just because, well, this is where my team sits and I think it's an interesting problem. So as we move from development to release, we want to do this in a way that's smooth, uh, 
doesn't have too many bumps, you know, it works when you need it to, uh, it's reliable. The key one here is automatable. Uh, it'd be good if we could automate this as much as possible. Maybe not entirely, maybe we want human in the loop occasionally, because well, we do, but, you know, get rid of those sore points and those, those things that break occasionally. And then transparent, we want to know what happens, when it happens, did it work, etc. Now what we're actually pushing to release here, we have a few uh, well, requirements for it as well. So we'd like it to be available, uh, we'd like it to be secure, we want it to be monitored, so we want to know is it still up, and uh, if it's up, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then finally, we want it to be swappable, so if it's no longer working as expected, how can we swap it out? Seems pretty easy, right? Like, nothing too complicated here. Uh, it should be a well understood problem. But what I'm going to tell you is the opposite. It's a somewhat underappreciated problem, at least that I've observed within the field. Uh, maybe not at all companies, but uh, at least when you look at various ones, like, it's unappreciated, and I think this is because of a few different reasons. So one, uh, well, I'll call it, so multidisciplinary experts in research environment. So what I mean by this is, the field of AI and machine learning is very multidisciplinary. And I don't want to say this is a bad thing because I think the fact that it's a multidisciplinary field, people come from every sort of background is a real strength. It uh, means we can approach problems from different angles. It really lets us understand the data that we're working with instead of if you just give it to someone who never worked in your field. But at the same time, when you start looking at problems of uh, releasing software to production, it does help to have either you know, training or at least experience with uh, working in software development, software engineering, et cetera. Uh, until you've had this experience and worked that way, you may not know what you're missing. Uh, the, the second part here being research environment. Uh, I, I think how we work in the field is good, and it's, but it, it has a bit of a lone wolf attitude to it. So like, people are constantly trying to beat records. Uh, every, when, you, when you do something cool, how I see it released often is they'll write a, you know, they'll, they'll publish their code on GitHub and then they'll write a Medium blog uh, or just publish a Jupyter notebook explaining what they did and why it's novel. And, and this is great because it means what they did is accessible. Anybody can consume it and move on. But um, that's probably not the best way to release software in a secure manner that you want it to be used in a controlled environment. Uh, the, the second one, and maybe this is one of the more obvious is that there's a hierarchy of needs and when we're building any kind of product. So if you think about a business setting out to build something, there's going to be a number of things that they want that product to have. Uh, a lot of those things will be the bare minimum that they need for that product to work. And they may say, they may have lofty goals and say, okay, we're also gonna have this cool piece of AI that really improves it. Now, as you know, when deadlines start slipping and the customer is calling, the thing that's going to be uh, cut first is probably those nice to have near the end. So unless you're planning to have AI embedded within your product right off the bat, this, uh, you know, you may not get here. Okay, the third is uh, this idea of the world's moving faster, particularly, well, okay, in a lot of fields, but in, in this field too, right? So what worked five years ago, you may have been fine just having analysts or data scientists running models, putting the output into Sheets or Excel, uh, and sharing that with, uh, with the business, and they were able to get a lot of value from that. That was a perfectly fine way to work. Uh, but we're, what we're seeing now is with increased automation and just general digital transformation, this idea that that's no longer keeping pace, it doesn't scale, uh, you need ways to call these insights you know, regularly. And with that, I see the pizza here. This would be a good time to break. <laughs> yeah, let's take, no, let's take yeah. five or ten, get a pizza, if yeah. you want pizza, and then uh, we'll let Nathan finish his presentation. But eat it while it's hot. We don't want it to get cold. Yeah. <laughs> so what time is it? So, How am I doing? Yeah. So. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Like, when we hear you, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, you don't hear this? Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Because we should hear the speaker more than Okay. Just, just saying. Yeah, no, thanks. Okay, so where we left off, is that better? Can everybody hear me in the back if I just talk like this? No? no? I'm not very good at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll keep it right here. Perfect. Yeah. So where we left off, uh, I was just going through the problems of moving from development to release. Now, when we're talking about release, what are we actually talking about? Like, what, what are we trying to put into production? So I think if you look at the, well, the space of where we work, so machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's different classes of, uh, of well, services that you can offer. If we look here, uh, just on the left, I have uh, data as a service. So lo lots of different definitions for this. Uh, how I'm using it here is generated by batch processing, so maybe some regular script that creates some kind of uh, output. Uh, that is moved somewhere, and then your service actually just consumes from, uh, from what's here. Like it takes an ID, it gives the canned response. So nothing uh, really like super fancy going on behind the scenes, but you're still offering data uh, and you're still offering predictions. They may be a little stale. You're not running anything in real time. You're updating when you can, uh, but that's the idea there. Uh, now machine learning as a service is kind of the next level I see from this. So this is where you're not just uh, taking the ID, finding the right row in a database and returning the answer. You're actually running that compute on demand. So I see this as analogous to the, uh, like scikit-learn predict. So you're running that predict on the incoming data. You don't know what the customer or what the, the API is going to give you ahead of time. You just serve it. That was close. Uh, so again, on-demand processing here. Now, the, the two on the right are, are slightly different. So embedded, meaning to yeah. Sorry, can I yeah? ask? The ML as a service, is that similar to like function as a service? Is that what you mean? Like when it's getting called, it's running it at that time? Uh, yes, I would say that. Uh, obviously, function as a service can be not ML as a service. It, it, it could be doing yeah. a database lookup, so it could be data as a service. But what I mean is you need, uh, you need something dedicated that understands the actual model and can run it when, when you need it. Uh, but it, it could be hosted in other ways other than function as a service. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, embedded here. So by this, I mean your solution lives alongside whatever is using it. This could be extremely simple. So you could uh, pickle a, a logistic regression, put it in your web server, and call it just from the website or even client side if you're, you're interested in that. Uh, to me, that would be embedded because you're not, there's no network call per se. You're, you're, you're just shifting it alongside. It could also be extremely complex because you can start looking at advanced Internet of Things style, uh, like problems. You can look at wearables. Uh, obviously, these have more demanding network, rear, well, network like you, you need to be able to update the model remotely even though it's embedded within the device. There's uh, not a lot of that going on right now in my space, but worth knowing. And then real time. So to me, real time, it's very similar to machine learning as a service. It actually probably is. You could call it a subset. I, I'm just calling it out as separate here because I think these problems are generally bigger. They're generally faster. Uh, you need dedicated you know, pipelines to handle large amounts of data. And uh, well, they're possibly online, so they're possibly learning on demand. They're, they're learning based on what's coming in. Uh, I think our next speaker may at least touch on some of these concepts. Now, just a, a quick slide on how these uh, scale up to each other, or, or how they, they stack. So if we look at the complexity of delivering these types of solutions, at, at the very bottom, you have you know, these simple embedded models, as well as just, say, data as a service. Now, machine learning as a service, maybe it's more complex than data as a service. It really depends what you're doing. It can range from extremely simple to requiring a ton of different infrastructure to support. Uh, and then embedded or Internet of Things, uh, new, new up and coming stuff with distributed and split models. And then well, who knows what's next? Maybe you guys can tell me. Uh, yeah.
Yeah, so, uh, well, embedded, uh, part of it comes from what you're shipping and how it interacts with each other. So if you're just shipping one product with something embedded, you're just shipping one product. If uh, you're shipping something that has a network dependency on something else, you start looking at microservices, you have dependencies and you have to ship multiple things. That, so that's one way. Uh, another is just in the, the computation required. So very simple models, maybe they can run anywhere. Um, very big OCR pipelines may require you know, really big dedicated resources that you have to account for and you have to have running somewhere. So again, uh, the types of production deployments that we're focused on today are primarily what I'm calling these machine learning as a service. Uh, another distinction here, so like when Google or any big company offers machine learning, things like vision API, uh, natural language processing API, et cetera. Uh, this is machine learning as a service. They're, you know, you're making a call, you may be paying them a little money for what they're doing. I think within an enterprise, it's, it's more or less the same. There, there may not be the same kind of billing in place. Uh, it may only be used by a few users, but it's still kind of the same requirements behind the scenes that they have to, or whoever's hosting the service has to be ready to generate a prediction when you need it. Okay, now the, like, if we're looking at machine learning as a service, uh, and we're looking at this idea that they are services, there's a lot of overlap between traditional business services, just what general you know, software at companies like ATV have been writing forever. So it's not like machine learning as a service is something completely new, you need a completely different skill set. It's, it can borrow a lot from what's already in place. Can everyone at the back still hear? Okay. Perfect. So I want to fo first focus on uh, these commonalities between like, what makes machine learning kind of distinct and then what it shares with normal microservices. So one is this idea of access. Like if you're hosting a service, it doesn't matter what it's doing. If it's a service, it probably needs to be accessed by something else. Uh, how we solve this? Well. You know, all the kind of things we've been using to connect over the internet uh, for, for decades. So we have ideas of APIs, REST, so uh, you can start looking at message queues to, to fill some kind of intake using things like Kafka, PubSub, et cetera. So not really a hard problem. Um, lots of tutorials. If, well, if your language of choice is Java, you can start looking at Spring. If your uh, language of choice is Python, you can start looking at uh, Flask, Django, et cetera. Now, uptime guarantees. If you're hosting a service, no matter what it does, whoever is using that service expects it to be there when they want it. If, they're, if it's not there, they're not going to be happy, and you may be breaking them. So how do you guarantee uptime? Well, you, one, you can do redundancy. So you can host a ton of different ones. You can say, hey, look here. If it's not there, look here. If not there, look here. And the more you have, the more fault tolerant you'll be. Uh, maybe not the smartest way to do it, because uh, you can also start looking at what your cloud provider may have in stock. So they, they may have ways, uh, well, to scale that would be costly for you to set up just on your own. Now, okay, monitoring and logging services. So whatever kind of service you're doing, you're going to want to know that it is up and running and that it's logging whoever accesses it, whatever it's served. Uh, you want to be able to go in a week and say, Oh, like how many people used it? What did they use it for? Both for, say, purposes of security, as well as just trying to understand how it's working and how it's doing what it does. Okay, and that brings us to security. So any service needs to be, well, depending what it is, right? If you're offering a, a, a service that takes your name and turns it into your, uh, I don't know, makes it backwards, you probably don't need to, to uh, to secure things, like you're gonna make this public, anyone can access it. If it goes down, nobody really cares. Uh, but if it's more complex than that, you're gonna wanna start looking at secure coding, secure web practices, uh, just general patterns for authentication, authorization, and access to keep things locked down and secure. Uh, finally, uh, th this one, uh, maybe I shouldn't put this here, but traditional programming is written in well, IDEs, Vim, Emacs, just what name you. There, there's lots of different options here. 
There's no reason you can't write machine learning solutions in this. There, there may be better alternatives, as I'll show, like Jupyter. But in theory, like what you can write a business microservice in, you can write machine learning. All right, so what does this stuff have in common? It's, it's all very important, but it doesn't really add new value to, to what you're doing. So if we're looking at a team like ours where we're delivering you know, insights, uh, we don't really care if we deliver an API that is slightly faster, per se. We, we may have a business requirement that we need to, but we may not. We may not want to spend time on that. So how do we make it so we, uh, we can focus on what's important, like our, our machine learning content, and then not have to keep rewriting this? So one thing we can do is add this concept of dry or do not repeat yourself. So we can spend some time looking at our actual code, looking at the con or the makeup of our, our services, and we can say, what are we using? How do we split it up? And what can we share between different deployments? So here this diagram kind of shows, like we may have uh, two different models. Uh, they have two different API endpoints because they're called different ways. But we have you know, common key management, database management, uh, calls to subservices, document handlers, network handlers, just whatever you might be needing. Now here you can write once and reuse. Um, this has a few benefits. So one, a single place to update, a uh, single place to run unit tests, et cetera. Uh, and you make fewer silly mistakes. So even though you've written it once, you know how to do it, you want to go rewrite it again, you're probably not going to do it perfect. You're going to make a bug or two, and that might waste time or have worse consequences. So writing it once and reusing it is not a bad strategy. What it also helps enable is this idea of continuous deployment, so or automated builds. Like when, when you start looking at pushing things and swapping models in production, you may want to, uh, to automate this as much as possible so you don't have to call up your data scientist at, I don't know, like Friday night and say, hey, we need to update this model. It'd be good if as much as possible could be done by the machines. So if your code is well-structured and if it, can, uh, if it can blend into each other, if it can be uh, well, like plug and play, then you can start giving this to something like Jenkins or uh, pushing into a container, putting it on Kubernetes, et cetera. Now, the other thing you can do is you can let your cloud provider handle things. So, uh, well, I'm sure everybody kind of has their cloud of choice at this point. There's, uh, there's tons of offerings. They're all getting bigger and bigger every year. Now, just to this point, there is some, uh, some considerations when you're looking at what you can do in the cloud. Uh, it's, there's offerings at really all levels of, well, let's say between control, lock-in, customization limits, and overhead and efficiency that you can choose to use. So, well, at the, at the very left side of the screen, we have physical infrastructure. This is your, your server in the closet that you bought and paid for yourself. You can do whatever you want, but it's going to take a lot of time. But you can do it exactly how you want to do it. Uh, moving from left to right, we have things like infrastructure as a service, container as a service, uh, platform as a service, and then function as a service, which is uh, kind of the big up and coming one right now. Now, the, the trade-offs here again being, like when you have infrastructure or physical, well, physical or infrastructure as a service, you have almost complete control. You can choose what you can install, you can choose what security you're running, et cetera. When you start looking at platform as a service and function, you're a little more locked in. You're, you're at the mercy of whatever the cloud provider said. Uh, if they think the best security. And that may not be a bad thing. You may want to offload this to them just because they know how to do it and it's, it's not worth learning. Uh, various trade-offs just to know about. The, the other one here is limits of customization. So when you have your own machines, you can choose exactly what your solution is going to look like and how it's going to run. Uh, when you're looking at, say, platform as a service or function as a service, you're going to be a little more limited in what you can do. So you've got to start looking at what those SLAs the cloud provider offers is. Are they going to shut you down after 60 minutes? And is that going to be a problem? OK, so those are at least what I see. I, maybe I missed a few uh, between what machine learning and any kind of service really has. Uh, now I think it's kind of more the fun stuff. So what makes what we're doing more interesting, or what makes it a different problem that maybe hasn't been solved in traditional development shops? All right, the big one, and the one we'll probably spend the most time on, is notebook-style development. So I just took this, uh, 
this GIF off uh, Google, it shows the, uh, the basics of a Jupyter Notebook. If I'm sure many of you have experience with these, but they are, well, they're a really good way of building models and experimenting with data. I don't think we'd trade them for anything, except maybe better versions of the same thing. Uh, but a few different things here that you can see that make it a challenge for well, any kind of automation and just general development. One, uh, we see there's titles and there's paragraphs. The, the only thing analogous to encode would be the comment, I'd say. Uh, but these aren't comments. These are you know, different types of text with different meanings. Uh, another thing you can see at the bottom is this output. And not just output, but graphical output. This is something that, you know, this is why they're useful, because you can visualize your data as you work with it, but it also makes it hard to track things tr in a traditional manner. Like, if you want to start looking at Git, and you want to start tracking changes here, are you going to capture that image? How is that going to be stored? Like, that, that, that's a challenge. Now, the, the other thing, and maybe the less obvious one, is the fact that your code is structured into, uh, into cells. And these cells can be run in any order. It may be that you run them in order every time, or it may be that one day whoever's working in the notebook realizes that they need to run cell four before they run cell two. And they just know that and they always do that. But when you start looking at this, if you were to just take it and put it into a script, it wouldn't work as expected. Yeah, so the question was, would we recommend Jupyter Notebooks uh, for larger style problems with multiple outputs? Multiple outputs. Okay, uh, well, I'll get there in a bit. Uh, that there is some new technology that actually makes them more attractive in production. Uh, again, well, maybe we'll watch the field and see how these mature, but they're, they're the other options. Ah, but we'll just get there. Now, what I'm showing here is the back end of a Jupyter notebook. So if you actually go to Notepad++ and open up your IPython notebook file, uh, what you see is that it's actually JSON, well, well-structured JSON, with uh, your cell type code, uh, how many times it's been run, uh, standard error. You can see here, this is actually output. Uh, here you go, here's your actual Python import uh, commands, and then what it ran. Now, if you actually look at these and follow them, if you run an entire cell of, IP, like, of Jupyter Notebook and then you save it, all that output will also be captured in here. If that output is some kind of TensorFlow initialization or training, that could be 20,000 lines, uh, which, which is fine if you don't have to read it. But when you start using Git to track your notebooks, suddenly these change every time and you end up with 20,000 different lines. That makes it difficult to find what the actual code changes were there. All right, a few possible solutions. So this should help answer that question. Uh, so one, you can get good at copying your code. You can uh, look at what you've written in the cells, say, oh, this works, this works, this works, copy them out into one script, and then use that and run that where you need it. It, it works, it, it's done quite a bit. Uh, what I'd say is don't make any typos, especially if you're updating things. If you're working in your notebook and then copying to the script, don't miss anything. Uh, so I, I wouldn't recommend it as a long-term strategy. Instead, I'd look at things like modularizing your ML code. So just like we did with our service, where we picked apart different, uh, different functionality modules. Uh, remember, your ML is a piece of functionality. You can write this as a package as well. And how this looks is, well, th th this is just a toy example here. But imagine a cell. Uh, Instead of writing our model in the cell itself, and maybe we do write it in the cell at the start, we do a one-time copy into a Python file, we import that, and we start using this in our notebook. We can still run the code in that package, and we structure it. Nice code that we want to share is in a single, well, it could be a single file, it could be a single package, uh, just what, whatever your unit of transmission is here. Now what this makes it easy to do is take that same code that you're working with on the left in your notebook and uh, operationalize this through some kind of automated pipeline. Now, uh, the third 
uh, well, the third way to work with Jupyter Notebooks is something I'm just learning about myself. So it's, it's this idea of well, Jupyter script wrappers. So these are, well, I'll show an article here. So this is uh, something I saw that Netflix is doing. What they have is, uh, well, they've realized the value of Jupyter Notebooks, how it makes it easy for data scientists to build models, how uh, it makes it easy to share models or, and share code and insights. Uh, but, and they didn't want to give that up. So rather than, say, other strategies that I, I've shown, they're looking at this idea of, uh, what's it called? So I think paper mill is the, the solution they're looking at. It, uh, it, it's in this article here, if you pull it up. Now, it's actually a server that runs Jupyter. It, it wraps each script with an input and an output, so it can be called like a normal Python script. Uh, they, 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 they do point out in this article that there is a number of challenges with this, and they still need traditional microservices for, for some things, but I, I think this is an exciting space to watch. Okay, now just uh, moving a little further along on what makes this idea of machine learning services different from traditional business services. Uh, so the idea of accuracy and bias monitoring. Like we may monitor a traditional microservice to make sure that it's up and running, that it hasn't crashed, that it's still available. Now in machine learning and AI, what we often want to do is monitor it for what it's actually doing. Like it may be working fine from a technical standpoint, but what kind of recommendations is it giving? Is it giving, uh, well, is it giving ones that are outside any kind of tolerance? Uh, is it showing any kind of bias? Do we need to update it? Uh, so those are just something to keep in mind that you'll need to account for. Now you can do this either through real-time monitoring, so you can look at predictions as they're made and score them against something, or you can do this post hoc, maybe end of the week, look at your aggregated logs, see what the distribution is, and see if that's intolerance. Now this one is a little different. So this one's not unique, I'd say, to machine learning services, but it's probably more common in AI and machine learning than it is in, in anything else. And that's the idea that what we're building are quite big and they might need a lot of resources to run, which is fine, but you, you need to account for this. You need, wherever you're hosting this, needs to have enough uh, RAM and CPU and whatnot to, uh, to actually do what it needs to do. Now, possible solutions. So. Serverless can work if the job's not too big. I, I say that because I've seen existing, say, function as a service offerings have some kinds of, they have caps on the, the time they can run, the memory they can consume, et cetera. So you end up having to look at what your thing runs, what they offer, and see if it works. Now, if it doesn't work, you start looking at dedicated resources. So can you always have a machine that's this big on hand to run? And then more, well, maybe more scientifically, uh, maybe if you have a lot of time, divide and conquer strategies. So may maybe there's published work that shows I can take this problem, I can split it, and it becomes order n. Or maybe there isn't anything published and you can just go find one and publish it yourself. All right, now scheduled updates and training jobs. So again, this, the fact that we do this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this room, but it, it's something that like as a business, you would have to account for. You would have to have at least some process in the back end. This, this isn't serving anything, right? But it may be looking at what data has come in, uh, regenerating the model, and then pushing that somewhere where it can be useful. So that has to at least be accounted for, and you, you have to know that either a person's going to be doing this or some automation's going to be doing this. All right, so I thought I'd take my last slide just to to guess a little bit on the future of work. I, I think I put that actually in the description of the talk, so I owed it to you. Uh, again, not, no, no reason you should listen to me on this, but at least what I see is there will be an increased focus on how AI and machine learning work is done, so how data scientists work, how they work within the organization at a broader scale, kind of just what I've been talking about today. Uh, there will be a more increased focus on what tools we use, uh, just end-to-end -end processes, and I'm calling out MLOps here. It's kind of the analogous to DevOps, the fact that, I guess there's DevOps for software. MLOps maybe accounts for some of these unique uh, concepts that exist on the side. Uh, now, the, the second is workforce adaptability. So, well, everything is increasingly moving at a faster pace. Uh, Cross-training, well, in terms of machine learning, just learning new models, learning new techniques, 
as well as maybe some of the things I've shown here. Uh, and, and people need to be ready for these constant changes, like the paper mill, who knows? Uh, finally, this idea of cloud and serverless. So cloud, I don't think it's as, well, I don't think it's a new bet. Uh, we've been hearing the power of the cloud for years. Lots of organizations have bought in and are actively using the cloud. Uh, what I think is still maybe up and coming is serverless. There, there have traditionally been limitations with what we can do serverless. Uh, that doesn't mean those limitations will always be here. And I think their offerings will continue to expand and their, what they can do will continue to expand so to the point where they'll be more attractive in more situations. So it's just something to account for when you're looking at how you want to, to do the, your solution of choice. And with that, that's my talk. Uh, thank you all for coming today. And, uh